Good morning, everyone, to Hope, Healing, and Mercy. In the, today's show, we have a special guest who's going to talk to us about her experiences and uh, what she's learned about the abortion in the Black community. Catherine Davis is an attorney, author, founding member of the National Black Pro-Life Co Coalition. She started the Restoration Project in 2011, and uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk about that. And she determined to expose the willful destruction of life by planned parenthood. Focuses on positive change through education and peaceful action. Since 1973, more than 60 million children have died because of choice. And 20 million of those precious unborn lives were black. She's been featured in the New York Times, LA Times, CNN, MSNBC, ABC News, NPR, and more. She's authored three books, I've read one of them, The uh, Fight for Life, Turning the Wounded into Warriors, and you can get that on Amazon, The Fight for Life, Turning the Wounded into Warriors, and it's got a tremendous amount of helpful information in there. Uh, I learned a lot from it, and I know you'll enjoy it as well. Uh, Catherine, I had to say, admittedly, I'm unqualified to discuss the Black experience. Um, I grew up in a small town in Ohio. Uh, there wasn't an African American person. We had no Jewish population, and it was a very Germ German culture. So, I wanted you to come on and just share with you, uh, with us, your thoughts. How how is Planned Parenthood able to pull off all their stated objectives and and get people to think it's all about choice? And how can we change this culture? of death into one of life. So one of the quotes in your book, you know, to set this kind of up, you have to put it in a historical perspective. You wrote, in truth, women in every society have had to fight for recognition, equality, and sometimes even existence. For years, women had no legal rights outside of their husband. They couldn't own property, enter in their contracts, or earn a salary. And out of that birthed the women's movement, where did Margaret Sanger fit into this? And can you share with us her philosophy and talk about the Negro Project in 1939 with uh, Clarence Gamble of Procter & Gamble? Oh, sure. You know, I think we have to go back even further than uh, Margaret Sanger and her, her Negro Project. There was a time in the world, not just in America, when all women were treated as property, kind of like slaves um, without the eternal bondage, but, but you literally could not operate in society as a woman, uh, earn, owning property, trading, doing business, um, because women were considered for all intents and purposes uh, an arm of their dad or their uncle or their brother, you know, women couldn't have rights. And that's what the whole uh, women's movement began was to secure rights, especially the right to vote um, and have a say in the politics of the day. And Margaret Sanger was one of those who wanted um, equality with men, but in her eyes, equality meant more sexual freedom um, rather than the freedoms that other women were seeking, like Susan B. Anthony and others who wanted to be able to vote, wanted to be able to freely own property, etc. Margaret was more concerned about how many men she could sleep with equally the way men slept around. Um, but at the same time that she was pursuing an agenda of sexual freedom, she was also strongly promoting birth control. Um, and at that time in America and around the world, a woman was prohibited from using birth control. Birth control was actually back in those days considered murder um, to stop the natural body functions of, of bearing 
uh, children, that was just considered a no-no. And any doctor that would prescribe uh, birth control was subject to federal prosecution under the laws called the Comstock laws. Uh, birth control was considered indecent and immoral, so doctors were prohibited from prescribing it. Margaret Sanger began a crusade to do away with the Comstock laws. She started out in the legislature trying to find congressmen who would sponsor um, legislation to repeal the Comstock laws. She had no success there. So she turned to the court um, as her vehicle to, to tear down the restrictions of the Comstock laws. At the same time, she was a eugenicist and eugenicists were people who believed that some people were well born and others were not. And they got to decide who the well born were and who wasn't. And generally as a rule, the black community was considered not well born. In fact, uh, Sanger was so persuasive in her her dogma that she persuaded men like W.E.B. Du Bois to join her. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of the Talented 10, mm -mm. Um, but Du Bois frequently wrote about the Talented 10. And that was that only 10% of the black population were well-born mm. and the rest needed to be managed and controlled um, if possible out of existence. That was the, the platform that Margaret Sanger launched from, eugenics, uh, promoting a race of thoroughbreds is how she categorized it. And she had no problem designating which group she felt should not be among those thoroughbreds. And that was the black community. You know, and at, around that same time though, we had another group promoting eugenics and that was the Nazis. And, and Mengele and those, those people, you know, the perfect race and get rid of, you know, he didn't just slaughter the Jews, he slaughtered the handicapped, the, the, all those people as well. And, uh, you know, it's But the Nazis learned their eugenic roots from America. You know, we tend to think of, of eugenics as Hitler in Germany um, and that, you know, America would never participate in such dastardly deeds. Um, but the reality was, if you go back and look at the Nuremberg trials, many of those who were put on trial kept saying, but we learned this from America because America had begun implementing um, eugenic boards like there were 34 states in America who had eugenic boards that did force sterilization on women that uh, segregated people based on the color of their skin um, and did unconscionable things to those people because they felt like they were not well born. So you had uh, states like North Carolina that um, sterilized Elaine Riddick, who at 13 was raped by a neighbor and impregnated. And her illiterate grandmother was told, put your ex on this form. When Elaine delivered her son, um, grandma didn't know that she was agreeing to uh, allow the state of North Carolina to sterilize Elaine, but they did it. And so Elaine didn't even know she had been sterilized until at age 19 when she got married and she was having, trying to have children is when she found out that she had been involuntarily sterilized. That is a part of Sanger's legacy. She, her board members and she herself served on these eugenic boards in various states around the country uh, promoting sterilization, promoting birth control for those she considered unfit. And then could you share with us what the Negro Project was? Absolutely. She 
designed this project along with a man named Clarence Gamble of the Proctor and Gamble family. Uh, she uh, came up with the Negro Project, which paid Black ministers and physicians to go into the Black community and promote birth control. Um, she felt like the minister was the man to straighten it out if it ever occurred to any of us more rebellious members that they wanted to sterilize us. So I tell people all the time, yes, I'm a rebellious member because that's exactly what Planned Parenthood has uh, been doing and now is strongly achieving uh, through abortion in America. You mentioned in your book, the concept of skin colorism. And uh, as I was sharing earlier, the, uh, when I was a kid, my dad used to play records and one of them was, uh, I remember this gentleman, it, it, to this day, I was just five, six years old. Uh, the gentleman's talked about, there's only one race. There's not the black race, the Chinese race, the Indian race, the white, it's the one human race. You mentioned skin colorism. How is skin colorism different from racism? And you know, share with us how this has played out today. Skin colorism is when we put the color of our skin before everything, before all our values, what we think, um, um, et cetera. There is no such thing as racism. There can't be because there's only one race and that's the human race. But Charles Darwin introduced this concept um, in his book, Origin of the Species, the rest of the title of that book is The Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And he began to say that based on your skin color, one group of people were superior to another group of people. And that dogma has penetrated the entire culture worldwide, not just in America, that somehow the color of your skin um, uh, denotes some kind of special privilege or something or makes you uh, inherently better than another person or, or something to that effect. But skin colorism is where we allow our skin color to control what we do, how we think, how we speak. I have people say to me, as a white woman or a white man, I can't go to a black person and say anything. And I'm like, why not if you're telling the truth? The Bible says the truth will make you free. Um, you, no one should be limited from talking to another group of people because of their color of their skin. But in skin colorism, we have weaponized the color of the skin. We have used it as weapons against one another to beat each other up. Um, and we have, have allowed skin color to be used to keep us divided rather than united um, the way God intended for us to be. The Bible says we're all made in his image and likeness. Um, the distinctions that God chose was not skin color, but your, your nation, your clan, and your tongue. That's what he told uh, the sons of Noah when they got off the ark. When you spread around this earth, you will be known by your nation, your clan, and your tongue. So I am uh, an American. My, my clan is Davis, um, and I speak English. I've tried to learn how to speak other languages. It didn't work. So, but I am an American of the clan Davis uh, who speaks English. That is how God intended for us to approach one another, to, to interact with one another, not this, it really is a weapon that is being used to fight against each other. Um, one of the most heartbreaking things that I saw in recent days was when a bunch of young black children were in, I wanna say DC or one of these cities where the riots were going on. 
and they were making white people bow down to them as if somehow that was bringing about, I don't know what, equality, no. Reconciliation, no. It was simply a picture of reversing what the government and others have used for decades to oppress or suppress, uh, suppress one group over another group. And it was just heartbreaking to see that because it's really not bridging the great divide. If anything, it's now taken the divide and made it a chasm. And sometimes I wonder if that's not the underlying intent of those who are in power to keep the power and the politics alive. Yes. And, you know. Yes. And it and it's not party specific because exactly. there are just as many uh, elite Republicans as there are Democrats, as there are independents or libertarians or how whatever other label we place on ourselves. That, that have that mindset, that believe that somehow skin color has, has given, given them a greater leverage um, over people. You know, it's always fascinating how the role these wards are given out to uh, pro-choice people, uh, the Margaret Sanger Award, and yet, even in her books, as you mentioned, she she makes it clear she was trying to control the black population. And uh, as you just said, it's not just a right or left, though. You mentioned in your book, uh, again, the fight for life, turning the wounded into warriors, uh, about Richard Nixon, a comment, apparently, I, it looks like he was caught on tape or something about saying, you know, he was for abortion to keep the black uh, down and and then you had Ruth Bader Ginsburg made a comment that uh, Roe v. Wade was decided at a time uh, when there was great concern about a growth in populations we don't want too many of. So this is the whole spectrum of society has these distorted attitudes. Yes, and it is the foundation of the population control movement. The interesting thing today is that finally. Planned Parenthood has admitted that they were built on a systemically racist foundation, that they have acknowledged that yes, Margaret Sanger did pursue um, uh, the destruction of the black community, that she was what we commonly refer to as, as a racist, what I call the skin colorist, <laughs> Um, and, and they have acknowledged that their practices and their programs um, um, have had a, a racially destructive um, impact on women of color, especially Black women. One of the most disheartening things I saw was when the Associated Press declared that Joe Biden was the winner of the, the presidential election. Um, that Saturday after November 3rd, they declared Joe Biden the winner of the election. That Planned Parenthood in New York City, which was the flagship uh, center that they named it the Margaret Sanger Center, um, and then later said, oh, we're gonna take her name off the building as if that was going to alleviate the decades of of targeting of the black community that they had done. But the workers in that Planned Parenthood ran out into the street cheering um, after the Associated Press made that announcement and wheeling out behind them were the EMTs wheeling out a young um, black woman curled in the fetal position in pain that they had just injured in their center. And it, it, it was a stark picture of what Planned Parenthood workers and leaders think of Black women, that they totally ignored that they had just injured a woman who required emergency medical care. And we'll never know the outcome. Um, did she live? 
did she die? Because Planned Parenthood is killing women to this day, um, like Cree Irwin, who died in her mother's bed on the 4th of July uh, in 2016, or Tanya Reeves, who they botched the abortion, but kept her in the facility for more than five hours as she slowly bled to death. By the time they took her to the emergency center, it was too little, too late. Um, um, Planned Parenthood has been targeting successfully um, the Black community, and they have told us that their mission is population control because in 2008, when they did their tax filing, they said their mission was to obtain a United States population of a optimum size in a stable environment, whatever that means. And in 2017, President Trump had said to Cecile Richards, who was the then president of Planned Parenthood, um, that they could continue getting Title X money if they would separate abortion from the rest of the services that they provide. And she said, abortion is as vital to our mission as cancer screenings and birth control. So their mission is population control and abortion is the instrument that they're using to achieve it. And as you mentioned, at the beginning of the program, more than 60 million lives have been lost to abortion, a third of which have been on Black women. You mentioned in your book many examples of people who have bought into this and promoted this population control eugenics narrative. Um, who was Faye Whittleton you mentioned in your book? Faye Waddleton was the first Black president of Planned Parenthood. Um, it's so sad that she openly embraced um, eugenics. She is a pastor's kid. Her, her family grew up in the church, but she chose to turn against her family's teaching, and she uh, was the head of Planned Parenthood for a good number of years and helped to cement um, their doctrines into the culture on the question of choice and a woman's right to choose. Um, and she acknowledged that they were targeting Black, the Black community, and she acknowledged that there were donors who would call wanting to contribute to specifically terminate the life of a black child. And she didn't seem to have a problem with it and promoted the eugenic doctrines throughout the country. You know, I just don't see how as a society we can heal if we don't respect life. You know, that's part of our problem. You know, the elderly, the disabled, you got infants in the womb who are in, supposed to be in the most protected environment. And uh, it's, it's not A or B, it's A and B. We have to protect all human life and love all human life for respect of, of uh, any other factors. And to me, that's the most paramount problem in today's society. But tying in this again, uh, Sanger with the population control, the eugenics narrative, and um, you mentioned in your book, uh, Frederick Osborne, who was president of the American Eugenics Society. He just thought abortion was the greatest thing, didn't he? Since sliced bread almost. He did, because he could see, he was being a prophet, if you will, and he could see that abortion was going to be used to achieve their population control goals. You know, you mentioned Richard Nixon, who was a Republican president, but he was a eugenicist and he believed that some races were superior to others. So you had him, you had John D. Rockefeller who headed up Nixon's population council and they came up with all of these things like we need 
excuse me, a Title X program for family planning. Do you know our government is in the population control business? We have an Office of Population Affairs that is under Health and Human Services today. And they specifically target poor women and women of color to get family planning services. Really, you're talking about controlling the birth rate of the most vulnerable among us, um, poor women. And typically when you hear poor women, you, you tend to think it's a euphemism for black women as if all of us are poor. Um, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. But yes, they, the environment, the culture back in 1973 was one of, we need to control the populations we don't want too many of. And that's why Ruth Bader Ginsburg could say that because you had a president in the White House promoting it. You had a council appointed by that president who uh, was made up of members of the American Eugenics Society. And they had laid out a whole plan for how they could control the birth rate of those that didn't want too many of in the population. And um, we had Congress a lot funding for that Title X program to help people family plan. That was the culture. And Frederick Osborne could see all of, of the uh, things that they needed to make eugenics work had come together in the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, and so it was a perfect storm. Thanks, Kat. Pieces fell into place. And kind yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. And he was ecstatic. You know, this is the greatest eugenic advance of our day. And so they changed the name of the American Eugenics Society to something, the Behavioral Society for something or another, because now they, they needed to mask their agenda since they could see that abortion was going to be uh, so successful. You know, I hear arguments about funding Planned Parenthood and they're always coming out with, we provide health care you know, and it's really under the guise of the abortion. And um, tell us a little bit that you mentioned Cecile Richards, but she put, where did she put the, most of the uh, abortion centers, where are they located? Um, in 2012, there was a study done by an organization called Protecting Black Life under Life Issues Institute out of Ohio. And they took a look based on census tract data to see where Planned Parenthood had their surgical facilities. And what they discovered was that 79% of their surgical facilities were within a two mile walking radius of a black or Latino neighborhood. Since then, we have seen um, that Planned Parenthood has begun to construct what we call mega abortion centers, 10,000 square feet or larger. The first one that we noticed was the one in Houston. That Planned Parenthood is the second largest abortion facility in the entire world. And it is in the heart of the black community. Um, and now they have somewhere between 25 and 30 of these mega centers and 80% of them that are 10,000 square feet or larger are in a black neighborhood alone. Um, their targeting is clear. It's clear through where they locate their centers. It's clear in their messaging. You know, like you said, they tend to wanna call abortion health care because of Obamacare, uh, the, the health care bill that President Obama pushed and got through the Congress. Um, Planned Parenthood and other abortion providers gave President Obama a plan uh, for action and during his first 100 days 
um, it was called Advancing Reproductive Rights in a New Administration. And that plan laid out what their expectations were. They wanted more Title X money. They wanted to do away with the Hyde Amendment and all of the amendments that restrict them from being able to get to poor women. Um, um, and President Obama mirrored Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, after that transition plan. Well, just a week or so ago, um, I got a copy of a similar plan that Planned Parenthood and other abortion providers have given to the person that they say is the president elect. Um, and again, that plan is specifically laying out uh, uh, increasing their access to taxpayer money through Title X, removing the um, Hyde Amendment, the Helms Amendment, all of the amendments that restrict them from getting taxpayer funds, and then expanding uh, um, the provisions to allow American taxpayer dollars to go to other nations through the UN to expand their population reach. They are very bold in saying that they, they want population control and they are very bold in identifying the group of people uh, whose population they want to control, which nine times out of 10 is the black population. I wanna go back, this is such a basic question, but you know, you're an attorney, I'm a medical doctor, but I've never understood how attorneys, judges can interpret the constitution when we talk about the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, you're not going to have much liberty and you're not going to have much uh, pursuit of happiness if you don't have your life. And how can they terminate a child? I remember them asking President Obama in a political, uh, probably 2012 or so in the campaign, they said, well, when does life begin? And he said, well, that's above my pay grade. You know, so he sloughed it off and yet he has no problem, you know, many people don't think, and even now that there's a percentage that think we should be able to terminate life or even right up to the moment of birth, just a few seconds away, that full baby's ready to go and you're going to kill it. Or if it's born after an abortion attempt, you have the right to kill it. I'm like, how did we get here? It was a slow fade. <laughs> you know, it, they didn't immediately, uh, introduce into the culture this notion, the right to terminate the life of a child like they're doing today, all the way up to birth. They began by um, introducing the idea that we didn't know when life began. And so in the first trimester, the child in the womb is a blob of tissue. Um, it's not a person yet. And we spent years debating with the abortion industry, well, when does the child become a person, you know, that um, would be entitled to protection? But they've hardened the heart of people towards the children in the womb. In fact, they tell the black community that our children are like a disease to us. And so it is statistically safer, they say, to uh, terminate the pregnancy than to carry the child to term or give birth because they're now saying that if you give birth black women, you yourself are going to die. But it, it wasn't immediate. You know, if you go back and look at the Roe v. Wade decision, I always found it odd that Justice Blackman dropped this one sentence into the decision that it was like, where did that come from? Um, and he talked about um, pop, the, um, abortion complicating the question of um, race relations or something. Some one sentence he put in there that had to do with race. And it always puzzled me because Norma McCorvey, 
who was the Roe in Roe v. Wade, is, was a Caucasian woman. Sandra Kano, who was the uh, Doe in Doe v. Bolton, the companion case to Roe v. Wade that most people don't even know, removed all restrictions as to when you could abort a child. Um, Sandra was also Caucasian. So what did racial overtones have to do with complicating the question of abortion? I think he was signaling the Frederick Osborns and Richard Nixon's, yep, we're gonna use abortion to control the populations we don't want too many of. Um, um, but we've allowed ourselves to be lulled to sleep on the question of life believing that the child in the womb is not entitled to protection, is not entitled to um, have life. And so it, we, that makes it easy for a governor like uh, Virginia's governor to say, well, we can allow them to be born and make them comfortable and then let the mother decide what she wants to do because we've so devalued life. Um, I think it's time for us to, to reaffirm the Declaration of Independence that guaranteed us life first, um, because we have to bring back the value of children in the womb. The only way the human race uh, can continue is if we have children. There's no other way, no matter how many ways they try to create artificial wombs and all of that, there's no other way. And we must reestablish the value of life. Discuss and share with us your restoration project. The restoration project is a pro-life, pro-family, pro-education organization that right now is focused on life because without life, there's no family that needs an education. And so I do projects around the nation to educate primarily in the black community, but all communities about abortion's impact. Um, for example, last year, we did uh, the National Day of Mourning where we brought um, a processional of cars, trucks, vans, buses, from uh, Richmond, Virginia, where Planned Parenthood had just constructed yet another mega center right next door to a friend of mine's church. We stopped in Charlotte where they had literally snuck into the Cherry neighborhood, which was the oldest black neighborhood in the city of Charlotte and constructed a mega center that the residents didn't even know was coming until Planned Parenthood put their name on the door because they had pulled certificates under a different name, construction certificates. Uh, they stopped in Atlanta to scoop up some more people and we went on to Birmingham. Um, where we literally prayed and called on heaven to um, help us with this, this issue of taking the lives of children in the womb. Um, of course, the media suppressed our voices, so no one knew that we did it, although the media came out and was there in, in Richmond. They were here in Atlanta. They met us in Birmingham. They got film footage the whole nine yards, but not one media company um, said anything about that initiative. But those are the kinds of things the Restoration Project does. I do teas for pastor's wives to um, educate about abortion's impact. And it is heartbreaking to see how many pastor's wives themselves, before they became pastor's wives, were, you know, had abortions themselves and need healing um, from that abortion decision. There's a lot of uh, medical, psychological, spiritual side effects. Yes. Uh, years ago, I studied all that. And uh, it's not just a procedure you do on Tuesday and forget about that afternoon. That's right. 
you know. That's right. You know that you made an irrevocable decision because you can't put that baby back in you. And you realize this was a life. This was not a blob of tissue. They took my baby from me. And many women, if they were like me, I had two abortions myself. And I was like Scarlett O'Hara, Scarlett O'Hara rather. I'll think about that tomorrow and put it you know, on the shelf over there not, not to deal with. And in um, 1987, I had moved to Richmond, Virginia, and I attended a Bible study. They called them noondays. You would go on Tuesdays to Bible study instead of going to a restaurant or something, and you would eat the word. And that particular Tuesday, they were talking about abortion. And I walked in and when they announced they were talking about abortion, I was like the deer in the headlights. I couldn't leave. I didn't want to stay because this was going to be the day that I had to deal with my abortion decision. And um, it was the grace of God that my pastor recognized I was in distress. And he came over and began to pray for me and would not let me leave until he got a release in his spirit. Okay, she's gonna be all right. And he put uh, the legacy of Planned Parenthood, grand illusions, the legacy of Planned Parenthood in my hand and said, read this and go do something about it. Yeah. And that's how I got into the pro-life movement. But the reality is there's so many women that don't have a pastor like my pastor. There are not many pastors who will even talk about abortion openly from the pulpit because they either engage in an abortion decision with someone or promoted one or paid for one themselves. Um, so they don't feel like they can honestly um, approach this issue of life. Um, and so you have a, a ton of women around the country who are injured, whether it's psychologically or spiritually or, or um, physically, and they can't tell anybody because there's still a stigma attached to the woman who would have an abortion. There's still uh, a, a factor of shame associated with um, what you decided to do. And so most women aren't free like me. I literally, Jesus healed me when my pastor prayed for me. But we in the pro-life community need to begin thinking about that, helping these women who have been carrying the weight of their abortion decision for so many years unable to tell anyone and unable to reconcile in themselves what they had done. Um, so we need healing and, and we need to, to have healing ministries. And that's particularly so today uh, when there is room at the table, if you will, for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. You know, are we prepared for that? Right, the right. pro-life community and how are we going to help these women uh, when they can no longer make a decision to take the lives of their children? I think we can't minimize that. I know in our church, uh, Teresa Burke years ago developed what's called a Rachel Project and it's a weekend mm -hmm. retreat for post yes. healing. And um, Father Pavone and I uh, several years ago had written a book around Rachel Weep No More Behind me is an image of Jesus, the merciful Savior, and um, it's only through God's mercy, um, but we have to, A, ask for his mercy. We have to yes. ask for it, and it's always there waiting, but um, he wants to heal us. He's the great physician. Uh, Catherine, I, I just want to thank you so much for joining today on Hope, Healing, and Mercy. I hope we can chat again down the road. We just... <laughs> just touched a little bit of your knowledge in this area and uh, your booklet, uh, The Fight for Life, Turning the Wounded into Warriors. There was so much good information for me, 
better understanding uh, what your battle's all about. And uh, thank you again. And uh, God bless you in all your work. Thank you for having me and bless you. Thank you.